we're running a little bit late, but I'd like to thank everybody for uh, coming to this uh, SEDCOR Business Forum. Um, I've been joking that uh, we, we've had a, our SEDCOR board meeting and uh, the one thing you don't want to do is have a bunch of us economic developers try to, to uh, uh, cut short our discussions because we like to talk and, and uh, talk about all the things we're doing and all of a sudden we realized, oh, we've got, a, we've got a, uh, another event for us to join. So. I'm hoping that uh, we have some good participation from our SEDCOR board. Um, uh, we gave a little plug for this uh, coming into this as well. And we welcome uh, other folks that uh, may be coming to this through our normal um, uh, ag breakfast that we've done in the past, but we've been unable to do this year, unfortunately. But um, we're excited to share this information with you. Um, and also thank you for bearing with us as we had to reschedule from a couple weeks ago. Um, um, it's, it's, uh, we, we appreciate everybody's willingness to uh, uh, stay on with us as we uh, had to trans transition into a March event here. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we're, we're uh, not able to do our egg breakfast this year the way we've normally done them in the last couple of years. So this is kind of a combination of our egg breakfast and our um, usual business form luncheon. So it's uh, kind of two meals in one here. Um, but we're really excited about sharing the information on our Northwest Ag Innovation Hub. And um, we hope you'll, you'll share our enthusiasm over the opportunities for the region. Um, not just the ag industry here, but our, our, all of our economy, um, I think, can benefit from the work that uh, we're doing in this regard. So we're excited that you're on our, this journey. With I'm muted myself. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors, um, Burger International, uh, Marion Ag Service, and the Salem Convention Center. Um, you know, we're very thankful for the, your support and uh, also um, your important partners in the work that we do. So uh, we, look, we look forward to being back on, uh, on uh, Salem Convention Center grounds with some events uh, as the economy opens back up and we're able to get together in person. Before we um, kind of start the uh, um, discussion, I did want to um, share a video. Some of you may have seen, but we commissioned a video to help uh, tell the story that we're trying to uh, promote here, uh, illustrate the, uh, the role of agriculture in our economy. Uh, we thought it was important to share this, um, how our region's agricultural economy actually, um, you know, with, with 107, more than 170 crops grown in our three counties, uh, how that industry is also the driver of many other industries in the in the region. Um, you know, we want people to recognize as they're driving through uh, you know, farmlands here and seeing the, the variety of crops that are grown. Um, we want them to understand also that there's a bunch of diverse businesses that uh, also depend on what's being grown here and um, that add value and provide jobs in this sector. So it's uh, um, it's exciting work for us, I think, and hopefully this video helps raise the awareness of the importance of the industry here. So uh, um, we, we like to call it our three-dimensional ag supply chain, and this will give you a little short flavor of what we're getting at. So Alex, if you can get that started, please. This is a hop. This hop is used to make the beer you love delicious. And this hop lives here in Oregon's Willamette Valley. How did it get here? It's here because of all the industries and people working together so closely. First, this hop is grown on family-owned farms all over here. It is then picked by specialized machinery designed and built by manufacturers based here. It gets dried here, then stored here. Hops get delivered to breweries all over the world or to a local brewery like this one here. Brewers work their magic, adding locally grown ingredients like wheat, honey, fruit, and even CBD to produce beer here. The beer gets put in kegs, cans, and bottles with labels created by graphic designers who live here. Those cans, bottles, and kegs get shipped to bars, restaurants, bottle shops, and grocery stores constructed by companies based here, built with lumber that is grown, harvested, milled, and treated here. So the next time you enjoy a beer, turn your mind to the hop and think about all the entrepreneurs and innovators who got it from here to here. The farm, machinery, processing, storage, shipping, brewing, bottling, and branding. All that so you can enjoy it here, here, and here. All possible because of everything we can grow, produce, and build here in Oregon's Willamette Valley. So 
So with that, I will hand this over to Alex to introduce our uh, speakers and to kind of uh, to give us an overview of what we're with the work we're doing. What the real side benefit of this work is that we have a um, great bunch of partners that we're working with, and uh, um, we sometimes forget this is actually work sometimes because we're learning so much and enjoying the company of folks uh, like the two that are uh, with us today. So Alex, I'll, I'll hand this over to you. That's great. Let me get the presentation going. Hopefully that's working for everybody. Eric, yes. I, I don't see yours. I see uh, All right. the two intro seconds. slides. All right, two seconds. Sorry. Success. There we go. All right, perfect. Um, yes, sorry, everybody. I'm a little bit... Uh, trying to do everything at once. Um, so my name is Alex Uh This has been a little bit of my project for the last couple, three years. I'm really excited to talk about it and share about it. Um, I can go on and on and on, um, as probably anybody will tell you, um, because it's a really important project and I want everybody to know about it. I think it's a really important um, industry for our region and one that is uh, frequently overlooked. And if anybody, if you've talked to me for more than probably 30 seconds, um, I will give you the story that I grew up in Salem. Um, and until I started at Sedcor three years ago, I knew nothing of the agricultural industry. And that's embarrassing. Um, and so I have been on a vertical learning curve uh, since I started and learning about, about the industry, um, meeting the farmers, learning about the food processing, really just kind of, you know, the, uh, that 90 second, uh, the life of a hop video has been the condensed version of um, what I've been on so personally, but then also sort of uh, a said core has kind of uh, embraced, I would say. So I'm gonna walk you through the project, give a little bit of context before I introduce um, our partners who are helping us in this work, so. Um, so where we started, um, a lot of this work actually started in the city of Independence um, here in Polk County. Um, Sean Irvine, who's the economic development director, had um, saw an opportunity for independence um, and he was thinking about for, for the city and hopefully he's on here and, and, uh, and listening and uh, hopefully I don't misrepresent by any stretch, but um, seeing an opportunity for independence to be sort of that that interface between um, agriculture and technology. Um, I think when you talk about ag tech, it's, uh, it's very broad and nebulous, but um, considering the geography of independence, it, um, it, it made a lot of sense. Um, and so he had started a few ag tech meetups um, and actually also then uh, applied for a Ford Family Foundation grant um, to help hire a position, a rural innovation catalyst um, and he rightfully saw that that opportunity was probably greater at Sedcor. And so um, that position is, is me. Um, and so I kind of, um, in a lot of ways, this project um, which started there is now sort of taking the baton um, from the city of Independence and from Sean and kind of running with it. Um, and so as part of the work, you know, we didn't have a project identified, I would say. Um, it was still kind of squishy and um, and as you'll see probably is still a little bit squishy but what we had um, what we did with meetups was just kind of a, a simple formula right you get people in a room um, a presenter or something that's uh, you know so, some sort of expert or maybe a company to pitch something um, to, towards agriculture um, you ply people with beer and pizza which is an important um, you know successful event. Um, kind of a recipe. And then um, you see what the conversations are. And we had some really great meetups. So unfortunately, um, you know, uh, I would say a little bit of a victim of COVID, you know, where we can't get together. But these are the fun parts where you get to um, what I refer to as manufacturing happenstance, um, people having conversations with each other that they wouldn't otherwise be having unless they had showed up to an event. So this kind of culminated, I would say, in, um, in an event that we did with um, the Technology Association of Oregon, um, and the City of Independence um, sponsored um, in April of last year. It was the first event that we pivoted um, online uh, purely. And we, I think because of the novelty of Zoom in April of 2020, which I think it's hard to imagine right now, uh, this being novel, um, we had 70 people participate. 
And um, we'll talk about the design sprints a little bit more, but, and actually we're in the middle of one right now. Um, so good timing, I suppose. But what we wanted to do was take some ag problems and to pitch them to entrepreneurs and technologists and have them pitch back some solutions. And generally these folks are not from agriculture. And so they are not quite as familiar with the constraints and the kind of the layers and the complexity of agriculture. And so this event was really fun to, um, to, to teach agriculture. And honestly, just to be able, for me to be able to take other people through that same kind of um, journey uh, and, and sort of education and understanding of what this all means. So these are kind of, it's, I hope you're getting a sense that it all sort of, there's nothing really, there's nothing particularly concrete about anything. And we, um, we saw an opportunity to gel everything in a project. Um, there, the Economic Development Administration, which is a federal program, uh, has a program called Build to Scale. Um, and it's about, on, it's about ecosystem building. And we thought that there was a, an amazing opportunity to, to work on that ecosystem building piece of, of, uh, for this project. It, and not on our own. And I think we'll, I'll talk about that here in a second. The real, I think it's really important um, to understand the context around Willamette Valley agriculture. And this is something that I am very preachy about. So I apologize for that. But um, my sense is that every Oregonian should be proud of what we grow and the way we grow it. And I've learned this through multiple conversations, um, lots of uh, lots of people on the call, I'm sure, lots of farmers, lots of trips, lots of conversations. Um, but so that we, to under, you know, help me understand what the unique aspects of the Willamette Valley were. So this is hopefully a refresher for everybody or that it's innate understanding, but it wasn't for me. And that's why I'm so preachy about it now. So, you know, we are a high value specialty crop region. Um, we are predominantly family farms and the average farm size in Oregon is 475 acres. Obviously that includes lots of small farms, you know, um, but those things are not something that I took, that I knew at all um, when I started at Sedcor. And I, so this has been a really fun process to, you know, to learn, to meet the families, of course. Um, but then also understand that we, you know, we grow over 170, you know, things and have 170, you know, commodities in our region, you know, over 220 in the state. Um, and also understanding, and this is my other sort of preachy soapboxy piece, that every farm is an internationally competitive small business. Um, and understanding that farmers are wearing multiple hats um, and they don't usually have money and uh, staff to throw at problems. Um, so, you know, every farmer is economist, meteorologist, uh, HR, communications, marketing, uh, mechanic, uh, you know, you pick, right? It depends on the, probably the 10 minute block of time that you're catching them. And so understanding also that um, if you call yourself an entrepreneur and you're in downtown Portland, I would say, or Bend or Eugene, you know, sort of the tech places, um, there's certain support systems that exist in certain sort of programs to help you out. But I think um, when you, if as a farmer, which I sort of keep referring to as like the original, you know, entrepreneurs, um, you don't have those same mechanisms. And so I think we're truly trying to create that mechanism. So part of this um, and we talked about the, the three-dimensional three supply chain with, with the hot video. Um, and that means, you know, that we do the, in our region, we are unique, I think, in a lot of ways because we, you know, do the harvesting, we do the value-add processing, we actually make the harvesting equipment, we make the value-add processing equipment, we do this, the warehousing and distribution and whatnot. So we kind of do, we kind of do it all. And that's why I think we have a really um, strong, strong competitive advantage. So the problem statements that we kind of identified with this grant um, are kind of a little bit obvious, but you, a farmer has to be innovative, adaptive, and creative to ensure their competitive advantage. Um, we saw that the tech doesn't necessarily go rural um, and that a lot of solutions that are pitched to farmers tend to be um, sort of uh, Silicon Valley uh, pitching solutions. That are that are going in search of problems, and so that these um, that the problem they, they they maybe haven't worked with a farmer or probably haven't to identify what the real problem is and what the you know the use case is and how this would work, etc. Um, we saw that there was a pretty high cost, especially for that family farm aspect. Um, so tight margins, new technologies are expensive, um, and it, it and everything is opportunity cost, and so 
it's it's hard to be it's it's hard and expensive to be at the bleeding edge of adoption and for technology. Um, and then a lot of times I would say for and I heard that I've heard this a handful of times, you know, you try a new app, we'll say. Um, a lot of times, if you're an early adopter, you're kind of doing de facto beta testing on that product. You're not necessarily getting a turnkey, amazing product. And there's really no return on the investment of time and on the knowledge for the farmer to be put to be helping do product development sort of like while trying to run their own business. And so as a result, we we kind of the, the idea coalesced in building this Northwest Ag Innovation Hub, um, which is farmer-centric development of technology to help production family farms in Oregon's Willamette Valley. That's really the, that's really the basis of uh, you know this problem. This is what we're trying to solve, and we're trying to convene groups of folks um, and build a um, build a base of sort of referrals. We want to be sort of the pipeline and the funnel for um, for startups, pairing them with farmers, etc. Um, and I think the most important piece of all of this is that we're not doing this alone by any stretch. You know, we are just, I think, facilitators and we are working with fantastic partners um, here who you will hear from um, in two seconds. Um, the kind of the core component of this is building a regional farmer network. And I think this is perfectly in line with what SEDCOR does. Um, we get groups of folks from like industries and listen and we host them and if, or on Zoom, I guess now. Um, but what we want is that um, we want to build that base of, of farmers who we can ask questions to, make introductions for. We want to help them identify sort of new markets or, hey, what are you interested in? Um, we want to be um, that kind of conduit. Um, and I, I will segue right now to talking about a national farmer network. Um, Pete Nelson, who's the executive director of uh, AgLaunch, um, will speak to you in two minutes. But this is not just a, a Willamette Valley kind of self-contained project. We've got national partners um, as in Pete and Aglaunch, and then also in um, Spencer Stenrud, who's from Iowa in uh, Ag Ventures Alliance. They're a few years ahead of where we're at. So I would say that it's, you know, we're, we're five, three, five, three, four, five years away. Um, and it's still a little bit squishy probably for us. Pete is going to have a lot more um, sort of, numbers and investment and whatnot around how what this looks like and how it benefits both the grower but builds also um, competitive small businesses. So the other piece that um, that we've been doing, and I said we'll talk about design sprints, um, as part of the ecosystem building activities, we are going to host four different design sprints in the next uh, two years. Um, like I said, we're in the middle of one right now. These are week-long pitches, you know, sort of pitching <laughs> ag problems to technologists and then having them pitch back solutions. And no, nobody's you know, building hardware in a week. It's really thematic and sort of um, broad. Um, and a lot of the problems tend to be, um, it was really funny, uh, to, it's funny for them to, to walk through that, oh yeah, there's not a silver bullet right here. Like there's so many layers, there's so much complexity and you're also just playing the environment, right? You're just hoping for the best in terms of thing, and things you can't control. So um, the, the really the approach is that we think that um, the best way for to help growers is to have them be at the part at the table for product development, but also we want them. We think we can build better businesses. So it's kind of we're building a two-sided marketplace for all of this. So, um, and that's really the project um, in a nutshell. It is very sort of broad and um, I would say a little bit squishy right now. But a lot of this is just relationship development, um, connecting to sort of national partners and regional partners and the Tech Association of Oregon and Oregon Entrepreneurs Network. We're trying to build both sides of this marketplace to make the Willamette Valley sort of as, as competitive in agriculture as possible. Um, so I will end my bit there. Um, and uh, Pete, I think you should be able to share your screen. Um, Pete Nelson is the Executive Director of Ag Launch Initiative based in Memphis, Tennessee. He um, I'd probably a little bit embarrassing to like to tell you how, and to share how much I like Pete um, and how much when he talks, like I get really excited about what they're doing um, and what they are, um, the approach they've taken. This model that we're talking about was not, is, is sort of an ag launch uh, TM kind of uh, thing, but we are so excited to work with Pete and to bring that 
kind of approach um, and thinking to the Willamette Valley. So Pete, take it away. Right. So I'm assuming you can hear me. Just give me a thumbs up if you're able to see my screen. Yep, you're good on both fronts. Farming requires an unparalleled commitment to continue every season in order to provide for a family, a piece of ground, and the greater community. Currently, agriculture relies heavily on antiquated strategies to improve yields and market and sell crops. However, these techniques tend to favor large agribusinesses over the interests of the farmer. There's a new future in front of us, one where agriculture transforms the health and wealth of farmers, the soil, and surrounding communities. A future driven by relationships and enabled by technology. A future that includes artificial intelligence and new markets leveraging blockchain. Ag Lunch builds networks of farmers that work together to drive innovation and create new economic opportunities. Our farmers support new ag tech startups, conduct field trials, control their own data, and drive investment in new companies. These new companies are pioneering tools for soil health, water management, labor shortages, and resistant weeds. At the heart of this work is a simple idea. Farmers are the key to innovation, and because of that, they should get a direct benefit from it. Ag Lunch has connected countless innovators from around the world and within our own communities with farmers to create new products and ideas. We also work directly with farmers on value-added projects new crop trials, and alternative production models to improve sustainability and create local opportunity. Using Ag Launch's model, meaningful solutions will be built. Farmers will share in the profits, and a new pathway will be established to make agriculture more healthy, sustainable, and diverse. Please join us in building a farmer-owned bridge to the future and the next big thing in agriculture. Alex, I'm assuming you can still hear me. Yes, We're gonna I can. The, uh, screen. Um, thank you all very much for having me. I share the enthusiasm that Alex and uh, Karen and Eric have shared with us. Um, we're very excited to be able to work together. Let me get my slides in the right spot. Uh, work together on this opportunity, and we just view it as a huge uh, benefit and um, really ties well into what we're doing. Um, I'm assuming, Alex, you can see the screen. Good deal. Well, um, what we're about as an organization is what we call farms of the future. Those are carbon negative, um, diverse, um, focused on soil, focused on resiliency of the family farm, um, and that we see those as being anchored in the communities around those. So that's job created, creation, innovation, and we uh, spend a lot of our time uh, finding the right partners to implement that with. And we'll talk about that in a moment, but uh, we're very, very thankful for the opportunity to expand what we're doing and work with you all uh, there in the Willamette Valley. Um, Ag Launch at its core is a network of farmers. Uh, we're progressive early adopter farmers. I'm gonna talk about our region in a few minutes, but we're all about incubating new technology, value added opportunities. And we frankly drool when we see things like uh, the hops video, uh, not drooling just because we like really good beer, which we do, but just because of the supply chain being integrated. Um, I'm now a huge advocate of the Valley. Um, I can quote the same stuff that uh, Alex is, 170 uh, special crops, uh, 5 billion in farm gate revenue, and just the opportunity to partner with you all, learn with you all uh, is a huge, uh, huge asset. So what our farmers do, we're interacting with taking our data, um, our soil information, demonstrating technologies, uh, providing expert advice to new types of companies, and then just a willingness to partner and help scale things. And we're created uh, as a network and we're managed through the organization that I direct, which is a 501c3 nonprofit uh, that uh, is focused on bringing the resources in to do really what Alex talked about earlier, that each individual farm does not have the, the resources to be an innovation network um, and to support on-farm innovation, but as a group, we do. And so bringing the public and private investment in to do that. Um, I wanted to start with this slide just to kind of frame up why we think that there's an opportunity um, and an opportunity that's big enough for all of us to find plenty of places to play and operate in. Uh, and so I'm gonna just take us back, do a quick history lesson. Um, I'm a geek about this stuff, so it's fun for me. If it's not for you, then um, at least I'm not throwing a uh, table of elements or something up that we have to work through. Um, so, you know, we kind of have in our view, three major waves of, of um, agriculture. 
um, innovation that kind of have led us uh, to, uh, to, the, to the year 2021. Uh, the first is the basic domestication of plants and animals. That was the long one that took thousands of years moving us from hunter-gatherer uh, to domesticating crops and animals. The second one was metal combustion engine, how we think about um, harvesting equipment, processing, um, all sort of in line with what happened over that three or 400 year period around the industrial revolution. And the third wave uh, that's really hit us hard in my region, probably even more than you all, but you guys have some residual of that, is this, this chemistry and biotechnology world um, where very similar to pharmaceuticals, it's big companies that were in many ways selling um, even things all the way back to the war efforts in World War I and World War II, chemistries, synthetic products, um, synthetic fertilizers, and that really is what is dominated, especially for the middle part of the country, what happens in innovation. And so it's big companies in an urban area pushing out um, uh, genetically modified traits, uh, herbicides, products like that. And, and frankly, that model of innovation, urban, really centered, most of the work in this ag tech, ag innovation space has either borrowed that model or borrowed the tech model from down in the valley, which is kind of fail fast, build, scale. Neither one of those work well in agriculture. And so fortunately, the ones of us, I love the fact that Alex has now spent four years working in this. Uh, many of us spent our whole career trying to figure out what a lot of you all on this call know, that you have a base of assets there, you're building entire supply chains. But um, fortunately, uh, the time is right between falling technology costs, new business models that are emerging, and consumer preferences for traceable food that's healthier based on health outcomes um, and with farmers that are growing the crops in the right way. And we have what we're calling this fourth wave of innovation. And that's taking technology, AI, robotics, and biology, not some of the harmful synthetic uh, chemistries, and building new types of approaches to grow these farms of the future. So this whole conversation we've been having would not be quite as exciting if there weren't these global trends and North American trends in the direction of making the things that you all wanna do um, even more and more viable, connecting again, what we saw back to the hops video, doing that with all 170 crops with differentiated markets um, in, into you know, an, a lot of exciting new opportunities. So that's why we think that there's an opportunity. Uh, the reason why we want to partner with you all and are growing that um, is because we believe that if you have a farm first innovation model, there's a lot to learn and a lot of things that we can exchange best practices on, work across, in a lot of ways we can share the ball. And so and this is kind of a, a multi-channel uh, relationship. So it's market development, it's access to technology. Now, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in a few minutes, but um, let me just kind of talk through the partners as they currently sit. Um, Ag Launch is based, if you know your geography, we're in the Mississippi Delta. I'll show you a better map in just a minute and tell you where, where some of our problems are. Uh, we were started in Tennessee, but now have expanded regionally uh, through the Delta. The other partner with Ag Launch and SEDCOR that Alex referenced is called Ag Ventures Alliance. They're based in Northern Iowa in Mason City. And they're the exact opposite of what you all have, right? They have, they're the number one corn, number one soy, number one pork producer, um, but they have the similar mindset. So Ag Ventures Alliance is a farmer cooperative that, um, I'll, I'll give you a little more on them in a minute, but that, that came together for the same kind of things you all are interested in. How do we produce something locally um, and then make the product locally? And since they started that in the 90s, have put more and more resources into helping other groups of farmers and helping us think about, frankly, how do we get around the Cargills and the ADMs and create our own destiny for farmers with vertically integrated uh, infrastructure. Uh, again, which you guys already have in a lot of ways in spades. So um, we're partnering, uh, we've been very selective. This ag tech space is a very hot, overly hyped space. So we've been very um, selective. And I think the other partners, Sedcor and Ag Ventures Alliance have also been very selective to find partners that were really aligned. And the three entities are doing things like pursuing federal funding, figuring out ways for farmers to get connected. And we'll talk about a few examples of that in just a couple minutes. 
Um, by the way, I'm not keeping track of time out, so give me thumbs up or if you need me to move faster or get through things. All good. Um, our, our region, and, and again, I just literally drool um, when you guys talk about some of the opportunities you all have. Our region, just to characterize it for you all, I'll try not to go too deep, uh, but we're um, about 13 million acres. Um, the green kind of blob there in the middle is Shelby County, Tennessee, where Memphis is. This is the traditional cotton growing area, and Memphis was the traditional um, cotton sort of hub for marketing and trading. Um, we grow uh, a few specialty crops, sweet potatoes, peanuts, a little bit of um, regular potatoes, a little bit of green beans and a few other things, but certainly nowhere near 170 crops. Uh, we've got an emerging sort of local food, um, sort of nascent industry. Um, we grow rice, cotton, soybeans, corn, wheat, and grain sorghum um, as the commodity. So from a row crop diversity perspective, um, we're pretty diverse, um, have a, several different types of equipment. Um, but really what's where, where some of the parallels totally end is that right through, you'll see the squiggly line right through the middle of our area, that's the Mississippi River. And so if, if I can be frank, um, we're as a region to totally held hostage by the large grain companies because our logistics on the Mississippi River are so good, we can load grain on a barge and get it up to Decatur, Illinois to process or to export much uh, less expensively than any chance of putting in any processing. And so meanwhile, Memphis is a top 10 food and beverage producer. It's the only one that has excess capacity. Um, and we literally ship all of our commodities out and then bring all these processed ingredients back in. So back to what Eric and I talk a lot about economic development, we're not getting job multipliers, um, we're not getting the processing boom. So what we really at our core are setting out to sort of crack and where we think there's opportunities to work together is, is how do we do some things differently in a sophisticated way to connect in with our capacity with the crops that we grow here. So that's really at the heart of this. And we're doing that as I'll talk about in a minute by having farmers in a network, having them connected in to the latest technologies and enabling a systemic uh, sort of changed approach uh, to, to how we scale things. Um, I do wanna point out that within our county, um, we are a uh, population of 66% African-American. Most of that is um, those individuals are legacy from our cotton industry. Um, so there's a lot of institutional issues that we're collectively working through. Um, and we have a network of urban farms, primarily African-Americans that are fully plugged in as members of our greater rural farmer network where we're working on deals together, exchanging best practices. And our vision for this is if we have farmers at the center of innovation, tremendous amount of wealth will be created, tremendous amounts of innovation, and that we're gonna share that across uh, women, men farmers, small, big farmers, and across some of the racial disparities that we've dealt with. Um, I mentioned Ag Ventures Alliance. I just wanna give you a little bit more from, from them. Um, hopefully you all get a chance to visit with Spencer and their team, but they, um, you know, we've taken about a year and a half to really mature the relationship with, with Alex and Eric at Sedcor. Um, it took about three and a half years to get this relationship going, but again, it's a farmer cooperative. Um, there's 350 farmer members. Um, they also have an angel investment network that we're expanding into Tennessee um, that are farmers that will eventually um, be able to participate in as you all would like in Oregon. Um, they also have a subsidiary that's the largest rural new market tax credit allocation and they're making active investments in the projects uh, that we're doing together. And the way this practically looks is we've got farmers testing new innovation or technology here and we're um, also then doing parallel projects and trials in Iowa. And we have a network of investors that are connected into this that are backed by some of the farm credit and rural farm banks. This is also an asset that we're sharing with SEDCOR is this network because any of the rural uh, projects that you all are working on are eligible. And so this is about $500 million of investment capital licensed funds through USDA, meaning the fund, the venture capital funds are licensed by USDA, uh, but but uh, investing um, ag uh, 
excuse me, farm credit resources into projects like some of the ones that we're thinking about doing there. So back to what Alex talked about within the ecosystem, you know, it's a very similar approach and we're working on how these pieces fit together. The kind of projects we're interested in, and I call them enabling technologies, we're not interested in ag tech just because it's cool or interesting. Um, on another day, we'll talk a lot more if you guys would like to about really what are the uh, rationales and the interest in technology, where are the best places to place them. But what we're interested in things that help our farmers improve their efficiencies, but also position themselves to grow additional types of crops and pursue different types of markets. So uh, we've had a, uh, about 36 startup companies come through our program. Uh, we've deployed um, some state uh, cost share capital in helping run trials. And we've raised, uh, that number is actually substantially, substantially higher now, but about 40 million into our portfolio companies. What's really cool about this, back to this farm centric model, our farmers are at the key of this. So our farmers have selected the innovations that we've invested in. They're field testing and field trialing those innovations and own equity in these deals. So when you think about there's been um, employees uh, hired, there's been investment money gone in, all those cool metrics underpinning that our farmers in our rural distressed counties and our urban farmers actually have a piece of these deals. And so what's really neat, like when I made this slide, you know, five, five six months ago, um, you know, Rantizo was the first company to do drone spraying, very specific aerial uh, applicated uh, chemicals, um, and now doing cover crops. But now that, you know, they've now raised a seven and a half million dollar investment round and are scaling that company. Well, farmers that help do the initial trials have equity in that company with a multiple of value, um, much more than what their original investment was in. And that's what this whole model hinges around. Um, the other types, uh, and, and we see these parallel, I divide them into two types of companies because one is really this value chain um, processing logistics and it fits together uh, with the tech. But, you know, again, we are a, a top food and beverage producer, but very little connectivity back into our local supply chain. So we're doing a lot of work with things like um, high value grain sorghum varieties. We have some areas of our state where um, we've got grain handling capabilities and we pr can produce sorghum, but have... Um, they're not a major crop. So we can segregate out the different types of grains and we've been doing testing. And then some really unique projects like Stony Creek Colors where we're actually producing natural indigo in plants, um, just like it was originally produced. So we've gotten now regionally specific varieties. And this one is one that looks like it could sit in the Willamette Valley. It's one of our few examples where the whole supply chain is sitting uh, right here on the Cumberland Plateau. Um, and this company uh, just raised a $9 million funding round um, just announced this week um, to continue to build that supply chain. So from former tobacco farmers all the way through uh, a pair of Levi's. Uh, just a few examples. Um, I've got another chart I decided not to use today, but what we try to do when we're picking out technologies, how does it help the farmer now, but how does it fit within our long-term view of sustainability? So you're not likely to see us investing in traditional ag chem or enabling technologies that may help with profitability this year, but don't lead us to soil metrics, water savings, worker well-being and all the other metrics we measure against. So these are a few examples. Um, Continuum Ag, for example, is a leading platform of looking at soil health, not just nitrogen um, NPK in terms of, of uh, value for the plant and building an analytical model around that. Uh, technologies are working on cover crop applications autonomously. Um, and in fact, this would be a good time to mention, we've already done one small pilot project where we took cover crop seed from Willamette Valley to Iowa, where we, we applied through the drone. And then if you see that small little green autonomous vehicle with a little hopper, where we did a parallel project in Tennessee, where we did autonomous planting of Oregon cover crops, both in Iowa and Tennessee, in times of the year where either because of moisture or other farm practices, it'd be very difficult to get heavy equipment in there. So we're able to demonstrate both how all three regions are coordinating, but also how we can have a better sustainable production system. And at the end of the day, um, 
our model is relatively simple. We call it kind of the, the rural innovation uh, flywheel. So we've got these startup companies. What you'll find in the ag tech startup space, and I don't care how great their pitch is, um, they don't have any money when they get started. They desperately need farmers to help them, even if they don't think they do. Uh, there's a lot of hype out there and that our farmer network and by extension, as you all get plugged in and our partners in Iowa are basically taking these startup companies, putting a little bit of capital in, growing them through the farmer network, early adopters, beta, ultimately exiting those companies, returning a check to the farmers, just like we would out of other types of value added processing, but out of technology. And the goal is, is to create uh, a new value stream, well stream for farmers, controlling their own destiny on data and innovation, and then having an investment to fund um, the next generation of innovation and technology um, that are coming out, you know, out, out of our farm kids. And um, I don't know if we even have any time for quite, it looks like there might be a couple things in the chat. Um, here's my email address um, and, and website information. We've got some nice videos at aglaunchfieldday.com. But um, all I can say is we're extremely excited to work with Alex and Eric and Sedcor, totally consistent philosophy. And we're gonna be working through them, hopefully to onboard farmers in a way that directly you know, benefits Willamette Valley, but uh, also creates this network effect uh, where we're able to pool things and create market opportunities. Um, so if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them or we'll keep moving, but thanks again for having me. Yeah, we'll do the Q&A uh, after, after this. I think the, um, the, the, the takeaway of course is that, yeah, that network effect. And I think um, the other piece that, and that we sort of, we talked about, I talked about earlier, the Ag Innovation Challenge that we did last year um, we got a lot of really positive feedback and we had a lot of, uh, to be frank, just went all fun with it and we're having a lot of fun with it this year too. Um, and so this is not, you know, like I said, Sedcore just doing everything on its own, right? We're trying to lean on partners. We're trying to lean on Ag Launch and a few of the partners that we, um, that are written into the grant, um, the Technology Association of Oregon, um, Oregon Entrepreneurs Network, um, uh, Marion County as well um, has uh, dedicate some staff time. And of course, it's built on a foundation of support from, you know, Polk County, the Ford Family Foundation, Yamhill County, right? Like this is all, this is kind of a multi-layered, uh, just like agriculture, this is a multi-layered, uh, uh, big tent kind of sport for what we're trying to do. So I want to introduce Kara Toronto. She's the Chief Operating Officer of tech, the Tech Association of Oregon. And she'll talk a little bit about um, the design sprints and how they work. And I think what kind of uh, what we're trying to get at and why they're excited to work on the project as well. So Kara, it's all you. Okay, good. Can you see slides? Yes, I can. You're good. Awesome. Um, thanks for having me. Um, I really enjoy my time with my SEDCOR friends and with Pete from Ag Launch as well. This is definitely a partnership that has gone back for the last two years, but in Zoom world, that means like 15. Um, so for those of you that aren't familiar with the Tech Association of Oregon, we are uh, industry-wide association to create an inclusive role-class innovation economy in Oregon and Southwest Washington to strengthen our regional tech industry. So you're probably like, okay, interesting. How is this going to tie back in? But I'm going to get there. So we represent 500 companies across the state um, to become a Pacific Northwest hub of global innovation. And we focus on businesses, entrepreneurs in the community with events, networking, advocacy, industry development, marketing, promotion, talent development, and other resources. And um, the way that we look at our strategic initiatives are to develop extraordinary value to our members, um, innovation and digital transformation in the region, and how we can stay economically competitive. So Alex talked about the fact that we did one of these Ag Innovation Challenges in 2020. It started because Sean Irvine, the man, the myth, the legend, watched us do a design sprint, which is a way to approach um, the building of a tech product. It's, it's a week-long cycle that you go through every week of design. Um, you question the user, you design it, you get feedback back, you redesign it, you come up with prototypes, you get more feedback, you redesign it. And I can say this, since it's been said on this call and I can poke fun of myself, I spent 15 years in private sector tech where I could 100% tell you what solution you needed, whether you were a utility or a retailer 
or a school. I knew exactly what you needed. It didn't matter that I didn't know anything about your business. I knew that I could fix it. Um, and then about five years ago, I realized that that was probably not the approach that we should be taking from a tech standpoint. And I think Pete really emphasized like how diverse their farmer ecosystem is. Well, so is any business. And for us to come in with our tech and just assume we know everything was definitely not the right approach. So we had started working with um, Black and Hispanic communities in Portland saying, hey, as you um, put together your tech solutions for your, your communities, like, what are we missing? Like, what don't we understand? So Sean saw that and said, hey, do you think that you could do the same thing, but take the Portland technology community and look at growers and producers in a more rural part of the state and try to get that same um, sort of empathy for the farmers that are growing our food and see what kind of tech challenges they had. And we were like, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, and so I'm about to show you a picture of our first tour. I can 100% guarantee you as well that I lived in cities all of my life. And much like Alex, I just assumed that the food showed up and I didn't really put a lot of thought into it until a few years ago. And going out into the farms in the Mid Valley was really eye-opening. And it was important when we started having these conversations to think about the industry of ag as a whole and how does it modernize in a way that provides operational efficiencies, additional revenue streams, can create businesses in different parts of the state. And also like, how do you as a, as a farmer attract a digitally literate and savvy workforce? Because that is happening. Um, and that is a conversation that Alex and I have heard literally every time we talk to anyone in the supply chain from the distributors to the processing to the farmers. Like we can't find folks to do these jobs and um, how can we train some tech savvy farmers and tech savvy advanced manufacturers. So we really view that as a way to make our region more economically competitive with tech but at that intersection with ag. And so these last two parts of our strategic initiative have actually evolved out of the work that we've done with SEDCOR and the City of Independence and Ag Launch um, and taken us out of our Portland mindset and into more of our statewide mindset. Because the other part of this that's really important is how do you run some of these solutions on a non-existent tech infrastructure? And my favorite example was visiting Rick Rial Dairy with Alex last or two Decembers ago. And um, I was learning that per cow, per milking three times a day, 364 days a year, there's 15,000 data points that are collected. I don't know if you can do that math of 15,000 times three times 364. It is a huge amount of data that was being stored on a server on the, at the dairy farm and analytics were being run on an iPhone by a 24 year old, you know, son of the owner. And I was like, this is fascinating. This is tech that is happening at an enterprise level in unincorporated Rick Real, Oregon. And it was really eye opening. And I think when folks in, in downtown Portland hear that story, they're like, well, how does that get to the cloud? And what does their infrastructure look like? And it's almost laughable. It's like, what are you talking about? How does it get to the cloud? Like, are you aware of broadband throughout the state? So all of these things kind of led us to like, this design sprint idea in, in um, the Mid Valley. And this was our first tour. It was amazing. We don't have masks on because it was before COVID. We were next to each other. We went to Rydell Farms. We ate chocolate covered hazelnuts. It was fantastic. And we learned that um, much like every other business, operations are siloed and there's all types of ways to innovate to make these farms more productive. And so we did this five day ideation session that we call a design sprint and they have both been online. I really hope they're not online in the fall, um, but this is what it is. Like on the first day you define your problem and your defined problem is from your users. And then these folks that have these tech skills, they do um, some analysis and they generate ideas. Then they choose ideas to take forward. They storyboard them out. They maybe create what we call wireframes. Then they design and build realistic prototypes. And a lot of this is just done, you know, 
uh, online tools, and then they evaluate with the cross section of your target users. And so then in theory, what's supposed to happen is you then start it again next week. And our, the hope is that this creates some businesses and this start in Mid-Valley and they grow and they employ lots of people. Um, but what we're seeing, and this is the slide that Alex has not seen yet because I drew this on a piece of paper two days ago, was that where, where that heart is, because I'm super passionate about this too, and it is a not well kept secret at all that you know I'm gonna at some point buy 15 acres and a goat um, and move to the Mid Valley and be with y'all on a daily basis. But what we're doing with these designs, for instance, is really about ecosystem building. So it's like that's that where the heart is. It's with ag and tech and economic development. And what does that look like? And what kind of community can we create and grow and thrive? And how can we, as a statewide tech association, provide the infrastructure, the capital, um, and the workforce to help with this industry that is poised for digitization um, and expansion moving forward? So, um, Alex, I'm going to really quickly talk through the challenges that we have going on right now in this design sprint, and I'm done. Um, but if y'all need my Venn diagram for other economic development conversations, I can share it with you. Um, so I'm going to give a shout out to Jeff Freeman because I saw him on the call. I don't actually know if this is a diagram for carbon sequestration, but see back eight minutes ago where I talked about I've never lived on a farm, but we are working on one challenge where, again, with like creating empathy from a more from the urban developers, um, if a grower is doing these processes that they normally do to capture carbon back into the soil, how could somebody in Portland invest to either allow a grower to do more of that or at least that they feel like they're investing in the ag process. So that was our first challenge. Um, our second challenge is a Know What You Grow app. This was fascinating from folks that come from a technology background because they were like, oh, you just need to know the soil type and the weather. And then it was like, you need to know the demand of the market for blueberries or cherries and you need to know how you're going to ship them and where they're going to go and so that's been really fascinating to see this technology community be like wow this is not just about throwing together an app and then leaving and so um, that's our second challenge I think Mallory was on this call too she's been super helpful with that um, we did we're looking at a microclimate notification so as air temperature changes or soil temperature changes um, what does that look like for people 30 minutes away from each other? And in particular, with the diversity of crops that are grown just in Marion County alone, um, how do you let folks know that that's happening? Um, our wine goggles is a personal favorite. Bruce Sonnen um, and Van Duzer wine. I jokingly tell people this is not what happens when you've had too many glasses of wine and are trying to read something. This is how you can use um, spectrometry and different color uh, scales to see if grapes are more ripe or less ripe and help you determine which to sort and which to harvest um, by wearing um, a really inexpensive pair of goggles out in the in the vineyard. Um, this is a favorite. People are really intrigued in this and this one actually has huge market potential as we learn every time we talk about it. Grapes are grown in 50 states and all around the world. And then our last challenge and again this could be a weed this could be something that we, we eat. I just don't know. That's not my background, but we are looking at weed identification and, and what that could be in terms of a hardware software combination. Um, these are fun. They're thematic. Um, they're really giving the, the engineering and development community that is not rural an opportunity to empathetically put together some solutions. And we will have our pitch back tonight um, you could shoot me an email at my email address right there or check us out online. Um, and if you're not around or you, you are like, I cannot do Zoom after 4.30, we understand all of these conversations that we're having will be on our YouTube channel. So we have two um, design sprints up with folks sending challenges back and they're really interesting and fun. Um, we'll be back in the fall with another one. We may edit it and see what it looks like, but I will stop with one last thing. If you are in the Mid-Valley and there's anything that we can do to help get more tech enablement to you, don't hesitate to reach out. That is why we are here. And um, as Alex said, from our ecosystem building, we are getting a lot more airtime with some of our rural legislators to talk tech because of the work that you all are doing in ag 
um, and you being willing to share that with us. So thank you so much to the SEDCOR team. They're my favorite and um, I'm done. Thank you. Thanks so much. Can you, uh, if you stop sharing, Kara, that'd be fantastic. Um, I think ultimately um, we were re obviously really excited about this project. Um, I spent a lot of hours thinking about it and talking to people. Um, it's again, we're, you know, we're in three or four years, I hope to be exactly where sort of ag lunch is, where we have identified funding. We'd love to have a, a corollary to Ag Ventures Alliance uh, in the Mid Valley, um, you know, working with OEN and uh, Mike White, our venture catalyst, spun up a seed fund. I'd love to have uh, sort of a, a subset of that, right? To have a uh, uh, an ag seed fund um, for startups. And I'd love, you know, what we're trying to do is just um, pound pavement and get other, everybody sort of thinking about agriculture, excited about agriculture, and seeing it as a as a big opportunity. So. Um, that's the Northwest Ag Innovation Hub. I hope um, hope that's helpful. Uh, Eric, do you want to, I'll hand it to you for maybe a couple Q and A's. We've got a couple questions here, Alex. Thank you. And, and thanks to uh, um, Pete and, and Kara. Um, I did notice that it, um, Kara did answer uh, Diana uh, Knauss's uh, email or question about um, electric autonomous tractors, but we're excited about, uh, that's the kind of technology we're excited about. Uh, you know, figuring out how we can um, help maybe with some trials or some other things to to and work with our utilities to uh, um, maybe see about doing some of that kind of work with uh, electric uh, transportation. So uh, or transportation electrification, including on the farm. So that, that's an exciting opportunity for us. Um, the um, there was a question here about the Department of Agriculture, Oregon Department of Ag. We have been um, engaging them and kind of keeping them posted. I'm not sure if, if they're on the call now, but uh, one of the things that's been interesting is as we do, you know, as Alex mentioned, a lot of this is kind of our normal work at SEDCOR in some respects, you know, uh, identifying, uh, listening to the, the needs of businesses and identifying how we can uh, help. And one of the things that's come up has been around supply chain and specifically around uh, you know, growers uh, wanting to identify, it's, it's actually one of the um, uh, design sprint challenges. How do growers identify new products to be, uh, new crops to be marketing in the future? And what's the, and of course, one of the basic answers to that is what are the markets for future products? So um, working with Department of Agriculture here has been, um, I think we're gonna be doing a lot more of that to just try it in OSU as well, Oregon State University and Chemeketa Community College. I mean, those partners are engaged in this because um, we see opportunities to uh, basically leverage the research that those you know, organizations are doing, the uh, workforce uh, resources they have, and uh, the faculty and, and some really uh, knowledgeable and passionate uh, faculty and employees of those organizations to uh, provide some of these resources as we, as we move forward. So we're excited about that too. Um, we did get a question from uh, Commissioner Pope about the urban farm comments that Pete made. And I think Alex was going to maybe address some of that, but I did want to w mention one thing: the uh, they did their uh, field visits, you know, via Zoom also this year. So we got a chance to participate in their field uh, field visits when Ag Launch did those. And one of them is a um, was a visit to an urban farm there, and it was really inspirational. It actually forwarded on to one of our businesses in the region, um, a food processor here, who. Uh, I think uh, called me immediately afterwards and said, let's talk about this. Cause it was a, a mechanism that not only involved a, an urban population and obviously Memphis is a bigger city than, than uh, you know, the, the communities we have in our region, but at the same time, this is an applicable um, and uh, uh, applicable example of working with, um, you know, a neighborhood youth, um, and, and really trying to encourage uh, not only the knowledge base around agriculture, but adding value to it and serving neighborhood needs and putting local food on local tables. So it, uh, um, you know, we'll try to get that link out to folks because it it's, uh, really was some interesting things. But Alex, I'll let you answer. Yeah, yeah no, and I think, region. yeah, thank you. Um, I think, uh, I guess probably the, the one slide I needed is sort of like, what's next and what are, what are we trying to do? And I think part of the, the what's next in the next few months is gonna be all about um, building that network, um, you know, sort of building a regional farmer network, and then also um, hoping, I'm hoping that um, there's an actual application process to join the Ag Launch sort of national farmer network. Um, and uh, I have 
you know, my eyes, uh, my, my sight set on a, on a few local farmers uh, that I would love to see at the national network and helping, um, helping sort of pick the businesses that, that get invited to the accelerator, but then also sort of bringing some of those startups uh, into this region. Um, Commissioner Pope has another question about, and this is sort of, I think there's a lot of um, opportunities to talk about um, sort of uh, tangent, or not fully tangential pieces, but um, the next generation, um, getting them on the farm. I think part of this, um, I think one of the side benefits is sort of making ag sexy, um, to be perfectly honest. And I think I'm hoping that if, if there is a way that we can, um, that we can help farmers be more competitive and make the next generation sort of invite them and see that, you know, it's definitely not an easy job regardless, I think of, unless you have infinite money and time. Um, it's not, a, it's, there's no silver bullets for technology. Um, but, you know, when you talk to every farmer, it's all about, it's generally about multi-generational businesses, not sort of getting rich and cashing out by any stretch. And so I would love to be, I would love to, at the end of, you know, not the end of this, but just, I would love to help at least a handful of, of the next generation understand that like, hey, there's an opportunity here or spin up a peripheral business. You know, you if you grow up on the farm, you have an understanding that not many people do. And if you have an interest in technology, then there is an opportunity for you to, for you to be able to, um, to spin up a business. And then we want to help foster that business, make sure that it, that it grows and develops. So I think that's what I'm on about. And it's interesting too, just kind of coincidentally, we've had some recent outreach and discussions with uh, Oregon State's, it used to be called the Austin School of Family Business. And I think it's a family entrepreneurial center now or something along those lines, but uh, you know, um, succession planning and uh, you know, farm industry in particular. And I think this is, uh, you know, this has provided a little bit of overlap in succession planning too, when you start talking about what the next generation might be interested in doing and what types of things, you know, what kind of changes they could bring and how we can uh, maybe provide some resources to help that continuity within a family farm as well. Um, we did get a question from Brent Stevenson about an environmental regulatory perspective has been thought about this. Um, Alex, you want to take that? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, no question. That is one of the topics and the design sprint from last year. Um, there was a, one of the challenges was around a statewide ag data hub um, because the state collects a lot of information, um, but a lot of it's siloed. And so how do you you know, from a, from a farmer perspective, hey, do you, should you be filling out the same report that goes to maybe seven different departments within ODA? Or should you, could you, is there an opportunity to fill out one report and have that disseminated? The same thing for, and, and a lot of this data around regula regulation, to me seems uh, like a lot, there's a lot of opportunity there. Of course, making it a business, that's, that is difficult as well, but um, absolutely uh, lots of discussion around, around that, that part, so. And I did see that um, Pete had put in on the in the uh, chat feature aglaunchfieldday.com. So that's the website that gets to what we were talking about before with the urban farm um, uh, project that they had going on. Um, looks like uh, I think we've addressed most of the questions. There was a question about the countries that uh, Ag Launch referred to, and Pete's uh, unfortunately had to, had to leave a little bit early. Um, I, I believe it's the Indigo um, company that he mentioned um, that's got the far-reaching uh, uh, connectivity to uh, several countries. So we'll be sure to get that question answered for you, Pam. Um, I'm not sure the answer of that offhand. Um, I do want to thank our speakers. Um, and then also knowing that all of us uh, are going into the afternoon uh, design sprint uh, discussion today too. So I've been very appreciative of their time today to kind of help uh, not just spread the word, but share their enthusiasm. This has been a real pleasure to work on. Um, it's good work, but it's also just a really great bunch of people to work with. And uh, we're, we're excited about that. And it's also really like a lot of things that have been done. Um, you know, I mentioned this at our board meeting previously, the, the uh, kind of pandemic environment has really allowed us all to uh, connect in different ways and, and forge kind of new, um, you know, new partnerships. And um, I think we're all just looking forward to seeing what happens when we actually can all get together in person again, because uh, um, I think it's going to be, uh, we've got a lot of infrastructure we've been developing and we're excited about it moving forward. I would like to um, let you know that we will get the recording of this out to uh, to people that have uh, registered for this. So we will do a follow-up mailing. So you've got, you'll have that available. 
Um, we also do have this on Facebook live on the uh, at the SEDCOR uh, page on Facebook. Um, I would like to thank our sponsors again, Burger International, uh, Marion Ag Service, and the Salem Convention Center. Thank you for uh, your continued support and, um, and your excitement about engaging in this uh, specific event, um, you know, given the topic and, and uh, the importance in the region. Um, also, just want to give a heads up that our, our next business forum, um, we're, we're doubling down in March with two of them. Uh, March 17th, uh, St. Patrick's Day, uh, no vir you know, only virtual green beer will be involved, but it's our uh, annual uh, uh, Marion County State of the County that uh, said core hosts, and um, we look forward to um, um, hearing about uh, um, the state of the county here. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us and uh, look forward to, to um, working with you in the future on this exciting work. And please keep an eye out for uh, new activities with the uh, Northwest Ag Innovation Hub. Thank you all. Have a good day.